This is Kang Kang, a Chinese Valorant player who has taken the scene by storm with his insane mechanical skills. He constantly pulls off ridiculous plays for his team, Edward Gaming, and when you pair that with his showboating, there's no wonder the Valorant world has fallen in love with him. But there's more to Kang Kang's story than just being a great player. There's a deeper reason why people are so endeared by him and his team, and it's the very same reason why Valorant is set to be a top tier esport for years to come. And no, it's not him opping on Gecko. His stats at Masters Tokyo have been through the roof. Pro player stats are really easy to find, but if you want to find your own Valorant stats, there's nowhere in game to do that. Luckily, the sponsor of today's video, Valorant Tracker, can help you. You've probably already used their website to check your lifetime stats and match history, but you can't see live game statistics if you only use their website. Simple solution, use the link down below to download the app and see everything you want plus live stats while you play. I keep it open on my second screen and it's super useful when I'm in a ranked game. Why not download it too? Thanks to Valorant Tracker once again, they make these videos possible. To explain this title properly, we have to go back to Champs 2021, the first world championship in Valorant. There were clear favourites coming in as always, like Gambit from Russia and Envy from NA, but Ascend were the ones who ended up taking the title. Their run wasn't actually the most exciting thing about the tournament though, that came from Crew. You might know them now as the team that went 0-9 in VCT Americas, but back in 2021, they were the only Latin American team on the global stage. They'd played the international tournaments earlier that year and done okay, but hadn't got any major wins that you would consider upsets. Fast forward to the group stage match versus Sentinels, Champs 2021. They'd won an international trophy earlier that year and they were overwhelming favourites to beat Crew. But it didn't quite go as expected. Okay. Sentinels <laughs> oh, one round away go. from being knocked out by Crew <laughs> in Champs. Sentinels yeah. just ran in there with the, the Guardian. Away. With the Guardian! Oh! Crew took the win and moved on to the playoffs, where they would play Fnatic in the first round, an EU powerhouse team with much more depth to their game than Crew, although apparently not so much. Crew pulled off the impossible again and took their place in the semi-finals. There were only two games separating this minor region team from winning it all. Their next opponents were Gambit, the most recent title winners, and unfortunately Crew couldn't pull out the win. Although it did go 18-16 on the final map and is universally one of the best Valorant matches ever played, so they didn't do too badly. That was the first deep run from a minor region team in Valorant history, but it's far from the only one. Take Zeta Division at Masters Reykjavik. They were seen by pretty much everyone as the worst team at the event. By a lot. I mean, it made sense. They were the only Japanese team there, and Japan as a whole region had only ever won three maps internationally before this. And after getting humiliated by DRX, it seemed like not much had changed. But then they beat Fnatic and NIP to make it out of groups. They were getting better and better with each game. They developed a new slower paced playstyle, which redefined the team, and they went on not only to get revenge on DRX, but also to beat PaperX to eventually finish third. Japanese interest in Valorant absolutely skyrocketed after Zeta's miracle run. After never seeing their region flourish in any competitive FPS, they finally had a successful team on the global stage. And even non-Japanese fans fell in love with Zeta. Underdog teams have undeniable charm, especially if they're coming from an entire country that's considered as an underdog. So Japanese Valorant was on the map, and the passion from Japanese fans eventually led to them getting their very own tournament, Masters Tokyo, which is happening right now. And speaking of, that brings us back to this moment. The moment where China became a true competitor on the global stage. Because before Masters Tokyo, China had never won an international match. They'd come close, extremely close, but never managed to pull out the win. And after another narrow loss to T1 in their first match here, most people assumed the same thing would happen, especially as their next opponent was Na'Vi. That Na'Vi. China would have to wait for champions for another shot. The same old story. I'm seeing that knives, Bladestorm now with the dash. Plenty of updrafts as well to go. What can he do with it? Up in the air, the reactions! Dash away, one bullet left. Of course Kang Kang's going for it. He's feeling it. And Smoggy. He's maybe made this one winnable. 19 seconds. Spike drop down. It's favorable. Spam. But screens the reload. Fight. There! For the taking! Incredible stuff! The finisher, Kang Kang, seeks to deliver the final blow. Nobody's there. Three kills. Nine turn. Once more. Sprayed through. Map one is theirs! Get to. Evade's falling, still watched. Comes down to reactions, doesn't it? That's a wide face. Now he's brought it to a one-on-one, -on -one. okay. They tried to double swing and they've just given Kang Kang a pick. Yeah. Out to the open! You cannot grant him chances like that. It's a double clear onto the flank through short. Navi, they're still sticking around and they are paying for it! Edward Gaming! 
they converge, they collapse, they strike them down, and China get their win! Edward Gaming defied everyone's expectations and finally got a win for China. A 2-0 over a team of title winners, overcoming their demons on Pearl and showing their true prowess. With this incredible win, a rematch against T1 was in their sights, and Kang Kang was nothing short of confident. T1, we T1, we're sending you guys home tomorrow. He was completely right to be. They demolished T1, looking better than ever in both mechanics and strategy. Doubts about relying on aim jewels and the strength of their game plan seemed to vanish, and the world was watching as China not only won their second ever match, but qualified to their first ever playoffs. The tournament's still going on with the release of this video, but as of writing this script, Edward lost narrowly to Liquid in their first playoff game, but then beat Loud in the lower bracket, which is an incredible upset. Hopefully they can continue the insane form they're in and make a deep playoff run. But even if they don't, that entire story is what makes Kang Kang and Edward so beloved. It was the same with Laz and Zeta, and Kesner and Crew, a star player making their underestimated region a genuine contender on the global stage. Everyone loves an underdog, and when it's not just a team, but a whole country or region, that story becomes so much more. Fans from everywhere love these stories, but it's even more special for those countries that are rising up. I mentioned the hype that Zeta garnered from their run, and it's incredible how much Valorant has grown there since Masters Reykjavik. We're starting to see it already in China, where even though Valorant is still in closed beta, like, it's not even properly released there yet, Edward Gaming's results in Tokyo have driven the hype through the roof for the official release. After the game vs Loud, Kang Kang Crying reached the top 10 trending topics on Weibo, China's main social media, even though he confirmed he didn't actually cry, and he won't until he wins a world championship. What a cool guy. So we've seen multiple times now that smaller regions in Valorant can consistently create competitive, top-level teams that drive interest across the world. And that's the main thing. These runs ensure Valorant has global interest. It's not just NA, EU, or Korea dominating, like so many other esports. Almost every region in the world is represented at the top level. Just look at the Masters Tokyo playoffs. Out of the top eight teams in the world, there's two from NA, two from Europe, one from Korea, one from Brazil, one from China, and one from Southeast Asia, Singapore specifically. And that's only the top eight in the world. There are Turkish, Japanese, Central American, so many other regions teams that just missed out on qualifying too. This level of regional parity is not normal in esports, but having it in Valorant is an incredible sign for the longevity of the game, and global interest in competition has so many benefits. Of course, the player base is bigger, making the game more competitive, and within that, you get a wider mix of cultures and experiences that create unique storylines, like Edward Gaming. Playstyles are typically different between regions too. Just look at teams like PaperX, who bring something completely different to the game, and it's so entertaining to watch. In terms of financial stability, a global fanbase gives sponsors and orgs much more opportunity to reach more people, and that's their main goal, so they love it. And the most important thing about any sport or esport, the community. Connecting with others across the world who love the game, watching your region clash against others on an international stage, and creating defining moments for the eSport with stories you can only see with this level of diversity in teams and players. And of course so you can make an NA Keck W post on VLR after watching one of the best games of Valorant ever. Who does this? Who, who does this? These are the things that build a strong community that will last for years, and Valorant is well on its way there. Valorant has cemented itself as truly the most international FPS eSport, which is a great sign for its future. Let's not get ahead of ourselves though. A global fanbase doesn't mean success guaranteed. A game that knows that all too well is Overwatch. When Overwatch started its own franchise league in 2018, they had teams based on cities around the world. London Spitfire, New York Excelsior, Shanghai Dragons. And this idea of regional teams seemed to be perfect for a global fanbase. Fans have a team to follow instantly, and players from everywhere are represented in the league. Well, that was the original thinking, I'm sure. But there was a key reason why this didn't happen, the lack of an import rule. An import rule basically forces teams to have a certain number of players from that team's region, like in Valorant, where a team from the Americas region has to have four out of five players from the Americas. Overwatch didn't have that, like, at all. So even though the team was called New York Excelsior, it only had Korean players. There are good reasons for that, and many would argue that with import laws, you don't get as many of the best players at the top level as possible, but there are also huge downsides. This post from 2020 on the Overwatch League subreddit asks if an import rule needs to be put in place. The user in question, Senska, is cheering for their home team, the London Spitfire, but brings up that it's hard to feel a connection to a team that's supposed to represent London, but has all Korean players and is based in Korea. I mean, can you imagine Loud's Valorant team only having European players? 
they would lose so many Brazilian fans because watching their own country's players compete at the highest level is what motivates them to root for Loud in the first place. Valorant's import rule will guarantee that talented players from everywhere will be represented at the top level. That keeps the regional interest going, which creates a bigger player and fan base, more storylines, and everything I talked about earlier. The other main thing that Overwatch suffered from was a decline in casual interest, and the only evidence you need for this is the release of Overwatch 2. Casual fans are the building blocks of everything when it comes to gaming, and that includes esports. Riot are doing a good job so far with keeping casual fans invested in Valorant. New modes, agents, and of course, skin bundles are all great for the health of the game, and when integrated with esports events like the Gecko Showmatch at Lock-In, it can introduce so many new fans into the competitive side of the game. Valorant is headed in the right direction, and it's no coincidence. Riot Games are experienced at this type of thing, and have a similar system to Valorant in League of Legends, which has been around for almost 15 years and franchised for 10. There's no reason that Riot can't do the same with Valorant and make it a top tier esport that lasts for years. Of course Valorant's only been out for 3 years now and it's only been franchised since this year, so all of this could change moving forward. But for now, let's appreciate just how global Valorant is. We're pretty lucky with that. I've been Commend, subscribe if you enjoyed, and thanks for watching.